Ari, welcome to the show. So excited to have you. It's going to be a great podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, the Meat Mafia in, in, in the flesh. <laughs> Did you ever think you'd be on a podcast called The Meat Mafia? Uh, I, I thought I, maybe one day I'd be in a, in a film called The Meat Mafia, but never a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we were, we were saying prior to hitting the record button, we're really excited for this conversation and that there's a number of different ways that we can take it. Um, there's obviously the nutrition and healing angle. One of the, the similarities that we have is that I healed myself holistically from colitis. You've done something very similar with Crohn's, different approaches, which is going to be fascinating to dig into. And then you are a leader in the productivity space, maximizing your efficiency. Um, and so I, I think this is going to be an amazing conversation. But I, I think Ari, as a starting point, just learning a little bit more about your backstory and your healing journey would be an amazing place to start. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Dan, for having me. And so I guess the, the sort of nutshell version, and then we can dig in wherever you guys want, is that when I got out of school, I started uh, working in upstate New York in this on this big real estate project. I, I rehabbed these really old buildings into loft living. And the I was 20 years old when I started the project. And recognizing that an Ivy League education and real estate development doesn't really teach you how to build anything. The, the deal was that anybody that worked on the job had to teach me their trade. So I spent the next three years learning and doing every construction trade that there is pretty much and working my tail off 18, 19, 20 hours a day sometimes, eating a lot of really questionable foods that you know came mm -hmm. off of hot trucks and whatnot and whatever I could get on the go. I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day because that's just what you did on a construction site in the cold. And uh, I was drinking quite a bit uh, socially. And when I was 23, which was you know three years later, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Now, I, I don't think that necessarily the lifestyle that I had caused it. I think that in retrospect, there were things that were happening to me since I was like 14 years old. And the lifestyle that I had really set it off, which is, which is pretty common, not just the eating and the not sleeping and just the unhealthiness, but also the enormous amount of stress that I was under. I had amassed $3 million of personal debt when I was 23 <clears throat> and uh, was, I mean, it was just, it was just a very stressful life. I hadn't sold anything that I, I built this whole project. I hadn't sold anything yet. And it kind of worked out in the end, but at that point things were pretty bad. And I remember this particular incident, I was on a medicine called 6MP. I was taking like 16 pills a day, which was making me even worse in a lot of ways. And uh, 6MP is a, it's a leukemia drug from like 40 years ago. And one of the possible sort of uh, side outcomes is that you have like a 10,000 fold increased risk of lymphoma. And I knew that my grandmother had died of lymphoma when I was a year old. And I sort of like made that connection randomly. I was driving to Binghamton in my truck and it's like a three and a half hour drive and it was winter. And I called my uncle to ask him because he, he more aware of the stuff than, than, than my father. And I asked him like, you know, where was my grandmother's uh, lymphoma located? And he, he was, because he's a lawyer and he like just knows, he was like, oh, it was the terminal ilium. Um, which is, as you know, and some people might not, that's where the large intestines meets the small intestines. And that is where my Crohn's was sort of centered. And I like dropped the phone, I think, and then hit some ice and spun my truck out and flipped my truck over on the side of the highway. <laughs> um, and to, to make it worse, I, so I get out, I was fine. I was totally fine. And I actually, I wrote a letter to Dodge afterwards because the truck did what it was supposed to do and it was fine. But this cop pulls up and he's like, you've been drinking? I was like, no. He's like, can you drive away? And I look and the truck is literally on its side. I'm like, if you roll it over for me, sure. He's okay. Well, if we can roll it over and you can drive away, then uh, you won't get a ticket. So they got a wrecker truck. They rolled it over and I drove another two hours with like the passenger door ripped off and just like in a daze. So <laughs> there, was some, there was some bad times. It's wild. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up in the hospital one night. It wasn't, it was a while later. I ended up in the hospital for the, you know, umpteenth time. 
and thought that that was like that was going to be it. It wasn't. I wasn't dying, but it felt like that. It felt like this was like I'm done. And I made it through the night, and then I decided like I had to just do something drastically different than I had been doing, and that's when I began my sort of journey of self healing and self experimentation, which which began with the we fit. <laughs> the we fit? No way. Literally, <laughs> um, I started. I, yeah, I mean, I was really, really out of shape, and I was really weak, and like, um, so I started with the We Fit, and uh, got up every morning and started doing that, and then you know, smoothies was obviously the next step after that, and after like, I think it was like a month, I just started feeling a little bit better, like I felt like a little bit more in control. As mm -hmm. anybody who's ever dealt with a illness, where I, I think one of the biggest issues with autoimmune diseases in general is that like you're at war with your own body. And so like your enemy is always with you <laughs> and, you know, always ready to attack. And that's really hard. And so this was uh, like a, a way of me feeling a little bit more in control. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I went vegan for like a hot second because I recognized very quickly that was not for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it's odd, actually, because there have been people who contacted me who've seen my TEDx talk and they're like, you know, the vegan lifestyle like that you live is really inspiring. Like I want to be you know, it's like, no, I'm not, I don't ever, I've never recommended it. <laughs> I've never yeah. suggested it. Yeah. It's just something I tried for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, and then I was a vegetarian for like, I want to say three months or so. And that was the, the interesting thing for that for me, because now I eat everything and I, uh, you know, I love meat. So, so we're, you know, we're good. Um, <laughs> You're in our good graces. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's right. Meat's great. <laughs> the interesting thing about me specifically with the vegetarianism was that uh, one of the problems that I had encountered was one night I went to the hospital because I had an obstruction and I'm going through the list of things that I had eaten with the doctor who was whatever, some random doctor was on call. And I had, I had gone to dinosaur barbecue, which is just awesome dinosaur, this dinosaur awesome barbecue restaurant. So in I'm like, York, oh yeah, right? in New York. Yeah. So there's one in Syracuse. There's one. Yeah. So I went to the one in New York. So I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I, well, I had that. He's like, what'd you eat? And I was like, well, I had the, you know, the brisket. And he's like, okay, what else? I was like the baked beans. I was like I'm getting hungry thinking about this. And then I get, to, and then he's like, no, no, it's not that, not that. And then I'm like, oh, and I had um, like an iceberg lettuce salad. He's like, that's it. It was the iceberg lettuce. He's like, you know, it's just hard to digest. And I'm sure that the, the, it got stuck. I'm like, huh. So my, my completely irrational and emotional response to that was to be like phobic of vegetables and greens for like months after that. Like to the point where like, if I got a sandwich that had shredded lettuce on it at the deli, like I'd have to like pick out each strand, yeah. which is crazy. And uh, sure, certainly led to, uh, I'm sure a lack of nutrients in a lot of ways. So I went vegetarian for like six, I think it was almost six months as like a way of almost building up the muscle. Um, I remember the first time my, my mother-in-law who is no longer with us, but my mother-in-law was, uh, French and Spanish and was like, I, I, at some point in this process, she like gave me a, she basically put like a plate of like red cabbage in front of me. And she was like, you eat this, I'm like, eat this. I was like, like, okay. Like I'm like sweating, like nervous that I'm going to die. And, uh, of course I didn't. And so then to me, that was like, all right, well, I have to like retrain the muscle to be able to digest roughage and like eat things like you know, vegetables. Um, so then after six months, I, I reintroduced fish and I still think that the pescatarian diet, is like a really incredible diet. I have to say like that to me was very clean, very easy in a lot of ways. Uh, and then I can't remember, I think after like three years, I reintroduced meat and now I'm definitely like. I'm definitely a meat eater. And also I think that there's that blood typing thing too. I think there's certain people that just like need meat in their diet. And there's some people that don't, but, uh, and obviously stop me at any point. I don't want to just go on forever, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to sum this up. I know I said nutshell. Um, I started trying to all sorts of different supplements. I was getting blood. I was getting like a lot of testing done, a lot of blood testing. And, um, I started doing like DEXA scans and, uh, uh, gut biome and all this different stuff. And so I started to try different supplements and there were some that I thought I found to be extremely helpful, which I still take today. And then some that maybe weren't as helpful, uh, yoga became a thing as well. So, uh, I was getting in better shape, but I wasn't flexible. And there was, I saw some lecture at some point about yoga and healing. And 
I feel like the yoga really helped in terms of the sort of internal massaging that happens from the twisting and the, mm. and, all, you know, just sort of getting things moving. And I ended up becoming a certified yoga instructor through yoga works in that process. I also became an EMT. Um, I felt like that was sort of a initial step for me to find out a little bit more medically about how the body works and how I can apply that to my life. And, uh, but then, so I got to a really good place. And then, I you know I still had all this debt. I hadn't sold anything yet. I had, I had been living this life where I was working 18 hours a day and then I got knocked on my ass and I was, you know, barely getting an hour of work done a day because I was so weak. And the sort of confluence of all these things, I had to create a new system of productivity that would help me get more done in that one hour and ultimately help control my stress. Uh, and that is where less doing was born, as in less doing, more living. And so I went on to become a productivity coach <laughs> from that. Let's take a minute to talk about some of the sponsors and brands who support the show. Who are you thinking? I was thinking about Carnivore Bar. What, what are your thoughts on Carnivore Bar? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable product. We were lucky enough to have the founder, Philip Meese, on the show a few months ago, and he was able to send us a bunch of product when we started the relationship and absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, it's minimum ingredient product, beef, tallow, salt, and then they do have a honey flavored option as well, but it's so nice to have a bar that's like three to four ingredients. And like when you're following a carnivore diet, it's really tough to find products that are in line with that specific diet, you know? Yeah, for me, it kind of hits like the holy trinity of what you're looking for when you're looking for food. So it's nutrient dense, it's convenient, and it tastes great. And as you said, most people who are trying to eat healthy, the convenience factor is kind of a, a, a tough part. So just being able to have something you can grab on the go, know that you're going to have that nutrition for the day. It's huge. Yeah. And we, we were lucky enough. We got to actually see their factory too in Missouri and they're just doing things the right way. I love how they offer an option for like carnivore purists where it's just beef, tallow, salt. And then they also have an animal based option too. If you do want a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of variety, they have a honey in that option. And they're just people that are doing things the right way. They're very mission focused. They're carnivores themselves. And, you know, we're always on the go. We're traveling. We've taken a bunch of flights together to have a bar that has 30 grams of fat too. Like that's huge from an energy density standpoint, right? Yeah. He checks all the boxes or the company checks all the boxes. And I just think the fact that they're sourcing from a regenerative farm as well and Joyce Farms, just a win-win. hundred percent. So carnivore bar. So we got the affiliate link and then it's code mafia for 10% off. One of the other farms that supports us is Perennial Pastures, another regenerative farm out of San Diego. Our experience with Kevin Munya, the owner, we had him on the show, a young first-generation rancher who's really empowered by this movement of regenerative agriculture and really wants to be a leader in the space. I think our conversation with him was so insightful just in terms of how mission-focused he is and how he really thinks about his farm as a business and wanting it to be here 50, 100 years down the road, even though he's just the first generation of it. And I think just being able to spend time with him out in San Diego was kind of the perfect indication of that, where we got to go have a meal with him at his house, hang out with his wife and kids. Like, what an amazing person. And I think his mission focus around raising really high quality beef and restoring nutrients to the soil is just one of, one of those rare missions that I think everyone can get around. Yeah, he has such a commitment to really feeding the local community in San Diego, in the San Diego County, first and foremost, but he's also passionate about feeding the community around the country. So I know they've invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources to being able to order beef in bulk on their website. So I know, I know that they now offer quarter, half, whole cows directly, directly off the website. Um, they have that great ancestral blend ground beef product. So it actually has organ grinds uh, mixed into the ground beef. So you're getting the benefits of like an ounce or so of organ meat but because it's in the ground beef, you really can't taste it at all. And I think to your point, Harry, just in a, another amazing person, you know, he, Kev was someone that he was following a paleo diet in college and started realizing, wow, when I nourish my body with real foods, I feel amazing, had a really successful stint in tech, but realized that there was just something else that he was passionate about. So he's one of those rare cases where, you know, he put his money where his mouth is and he's a first generation farmer, just, you know, bootstrapping this thing, raising money and just so passionate about feeding the community. Just an amazing guy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening. Now we're going to go back to the show.
Ari, was there, was there a point in time when you felt like you could really take control of what was happening with your health? Because I know, particularly from like Brett's story, it seems like a lot of people listen to their doctor, obviously, and then start to feel like they can't really take control for themselves. So like, was there a light bulb moment for you where I was like, I can actually do this and fix myself? Yeah, so for sure. And I have to say, I'm very fortunate. I had a really great doctor. Um, my, the, my the initial doctor that I had that diagnosed me was, I, I think, should have his license taken away. But then after that, the second doctor that I worked with uh, was really great, and he put me on a lot of meds. But he was also really open with me about the information and sharing a lot of information with me. And like, if I wanted to get a test done, he would order it, uh, no problem. You know, like it, he was, and it got to the point where. I would come in and he'd literally, he'd be like, all right, so what pills have you stopped taking this time? Cause I was on like 16 a day. So, oh. uh, and I told, and I would tell him, he's like, all right, you know, we'll, we'll watch it. We'll see what happens. Like he was never judging me about it. It was really great. So I got very lucky in that regard, but, uh, the, the feeling of sort of a regaining of control was actually very almost immediate. I have to say that. And that's really the fascinating thing to me that so much of this is, is, uh, I don't want to say mindset, but there is a lot of it that has to do with like how we sort of pr approach it and where our perspective is. And a lot of people, they will be in the driver's seat of their own health and allow a doctor to drive and nothing against the medical community at all. And it's not the doctor's fault that they're, you know, giving advice based on their training. The problem is that patients, most of the time I find just don't feel empowered to make their own decisions and to be a collaborator in their health journey. So as soon as I like started working out uh, and like tracking things, I began to feel a little bit more in control. I remember that very clearly uh, because up until that point, you're just kind of like a zombie going through like, all right, what pill am I going to take today? What am I going to do here? What am I going to do there? And just feeling very helpless. Definitely. And especially the difference in a few years, just in terms of the advancement of technology, like it's very different. I think I, in 2016 was when I got diagnosed with colitis. And so for you, I think you'd said we fit. So is this around like 2006, 2008, when you were really going through it? <laughs> All right, very good, 2006, yeah. Yeah, so there have been massive changes in the yeah. drug. So your time period, it was basically like, the best they could do is just load you up on steroids, a bunch of pills, they're getting on leukemia drugs. So from your perspective, you're like, okay, maybe this leukemia drug will help me with Crohn's, but then, um, 10, 10, what was it? A thousand times more likely to get lymphoma. So what are we doing? We're helping one thing and then potentially adding to these other adverse health effects. So for you to actually be able to find a diet that a doctor that's willing to work with you about diet and lifestyle, and maybe there is an alternative way to just get loading yourself up on these pills. I'm sure that was huge for you. Yeah. So the thing that's so important to me, so, so, uh, I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the medicine. So I am not anti-medicine, right? The, the, the issue that I see all the time, and I see this as an EMT now, because I work actively, I volunteer actively as an EMT. Uh, and I have done so in some very rough um, EMS systems. It's really easy to take a pill, right? It's a little, it's, it's slightly harder or extremely harder for some people to make a lifestyle change. And the drugs are band-aids. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the thing that people have to understand. Like if you have uh, an open wound that doesn't heal, like you can't just keep putting band-aids on it forever. Uh, it will, you'll get through the day. It might not get worse right now, but you have to do something about that. And the, and most of the drugs that we have to treat chronic conditions or even, even things like cancer, right? Like people mm -hmm. who go through chemotherapy, you're not on chemotherapy for the rest of your life. Like it's kind of obvious, right? You make, if you make it through and you're fortunate enough to make it through, you need to do some changing at the very least. You need to get tested more often, right? Like there's things that we have to do. So uh, Crohn's I, I found particularly like is one of those things where they'll take a pill and maybe it works for a while. And then you have these people where it's like, yeah, I have good days and bad days. It's like, well, why, you know, like, have you looked into that? Have you tracked that? And it's like, no, you know, that's, I guess I just need a different drug or more drugs or a stronger drug. Uh, but we have to make these lifestyles. And you see this with diabetes all the time, too, where people, will, you know, they'll they'll eat something that they know they shouldn't eat, but then they'll just take a little bit more insulin. Like it doesn't work that way at some point. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Ari, one of the things I wanted to ask you is it seems like now in the context of autoimmune diseases, healing, et cetera, the internet is such an amazing tool just to connect people so we can tell our stories and share notes on diet, lifestyle changes, stress management, et cetera, things that have worked for us. Like that's really why I started an all meat carnivore diet in 2016 is that I started reading about sorry, 2019, I started reading about people that were effectively healing Crohn's and colitis by following an all meat diet. And I know that there were books like the maker's diet by Jordan Rubin that I think came out in 2012. And I even found this blog of this guy named like, I think it was like the Crohn's carnivore from like 2003 that healed this Crohn's going carnivore. So I'm just curious when you were healing, were there other stories or like, was there anyone else out there that kind of showed proof of concept of like, Hey, diet and lifestyle can help me heal this thing naturally? No, (laughs) no. Uh, And that, you know, most of the stuff on the internet was basically like, this is an incurable condition. You're going to die at some point, (laughs) you know, or you're going to have surgery and then you're going to have more surgery. Mm. Um, And then, by the way, the the doctor that I had mentioned that first diagnosed me, he did so by voicemail, right? So I get this voicemail saying like, well, you got your test results, you have Crohn's and here's what you have to do. And uh, I, that was like, that, that was a very, very bad Googling moment for me. Uh, so no, there really wasn't a lot. And, you know, part of it, which is so insidious about the disease is it's a young person's disease, right? And no, there's very few like, and, and I have to say, unfortunately, I'm seeing it younger and younger. I get contacted by parents all the time. And I'm working with somebody right now as a 10 year old uh, who has Crohn's. Uh, I had symptoms since I was 14 in retrospect, but I got diagnosed when I was 23. No, 20, yeah, 23. People don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about this stuff. You know, and, and my wife, my, my wife now, we started dating a month before I was diagnosed. Mm, wow. So like, it's like, hey, and you know, by the way, like I have to go to the bathroom all the time and it hurts. Like it, it's just, a, it, people don't talk about it. And I found that to be a really significant issue in getting the information about this. And there, there's also, I, I mean, I, I've just heard Brett and other people talk about like kind of the psychological effects of having to deal with something like that. You know, like it basically becomes a part of your identity and your personality where you're like constantly thinking about, you know, where you need to be and like <laughs> how, cl- how close you need to be to a bathroom at, basically at all times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and furthermore, so I had, I had obstructive symptoms. That was my, my biggest issue. I didn't have like, bleeding or that stuff like with uh, there's all sorts of different symptoms but the obstruction symptoms are really awful because you know there's there's something really kind of fascinating about the, the human intestines if you cut them or burn them like you won't you don't have pain receptors for that kind of thing but if you mm-hmm. stretch them it's one of the most painful things you can experience yeah. and so that's what happens when you get obstruction so it was just it was awful yeah uh, and it would happen often enough that it was a, you know a problem but at what well, it was often enough but also it, like it could come out of nowhere and then you know you'd eat something and you'd just be waiting to see if you're gonna be okay and for me almost every time it was in the middle of the night it was like two or three in the morning yeah uh, that it would happen so i just wake up like in pain yeah and then have to hope and then you're not sleeping and you're getting all the detrimental effects of sleep deprivation. But I think the, the amazing thing about your story is like, number one, you proved that you could heal holistically by taking your health in your own hands, doing yoga, cooking a lot of your meals. It seems like the pescatarian diet worked really well. You started doing triathlons, Ironman France. And then it was like this bad event actually led to this incredible business and all these books that you've written because you basically were forced to be incredibly productive because you'd had this condensed window to do work um, because you had had Crohn's. So maybe we could just segue that into just some of the things that you started implementing and started learning about productivity and efficiency through that experience. Yeah. So as I said, like the, the biggest sort of open aha moment, I guess for me was that I went from 18 hours a day of working to maybe one hour a day. Mm -hmm. And um, you guys look like you're a little bit younger than me, but I don't know if you're ever MacGyver fans. Familiar with them, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, I always like to say, like, nobody ever said to MacGyver, like, hey, man, there's a Home Depot across the street. Take the shopping cart, get whatever you need, come back over here, and we need to get into this building. It was always like, here's a paper clip and, like, a box of, like, you know, Pop-Tarts. Now you have to, like, break into the building. Right, so to me, 
the the really first lesson there was like innovation or uh, restriction breeds innovation, All right? So I'm going to take this extreme limit on my time and figure out a way to make it into a strength. Uh, and I still I'm a, that's a that's a really sort of big guiding principle for me. I think that when people have too much money, too much time, uh, too much space, it becomes really hard to be effective. Uh, you know, I, I would except for maybe like a medical research company, I would be much more interested in seeing a company that's making something happen with a thousand dollars than the one that's making it happen with a million mm -hmm. and just to see what happens. Uh, so that restriction was really interesting because the, the, basically the driving question at that point and for everything that I do now, I would say is what would you do if you could only work an hour a day? And mm -hmm. it's a really deep question because if I say to somebody who works a nine to five job, what would you do if you had to leave the office by four? They all, usually they just say I'd skip lunch. Great. No problem. But you ask that same person, what would you do if you only had an hour? It's a completely different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, the question really is not what would you do? It's what wouldn't you do? And if the things that you wouldn't do have to happen, then who or what is going to do them for you? And that is what formed the basis for my whole framework, which is optimize, automate, outsource in that order. We have to optimize first what we've got with what we have, then we can start to look at automations. And lastly, we can start to look at outsourcing or delegating to other individuals, specialists or generalists of various kinds. So that uh, that's sort of where it started. So I started writing blog posts about different experiments I was doing, one of which was a restriction on time I already had. One of Another one became a restriction on space, uh, which was a fun one because I had this whole closet of like electronic, you know, refuse, you know, old keyboards, cables and stuff like that. And I said one day, I was like, all right, I'm going to take an egg crate, you know, box, and that's all I can have. So I have to get rid of everything else that doesn't fit in there. And going forward, if I want to put anything in that box, I have to take something out. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's my limit, uh, which makes things a lot easier. Um, and so we I started experimenting with limits um, and then got into, uh, the number one stressor that seems to be like to this day, if you ask people around the world, or if I, when I ask people around the world, what are your biggest productivity challenges? They always say email. Email is the number one thing that comes up. Um, and so I created an inbox zero method uh, that helps deal with that. And it's an interesting one because the inbox to me is not an email problem. It's a decision-making problem. And decisions are very, very stressful for a lot of people. We only have about two or three dozen good decisions in us on a given day. And some people can do that in email in about three minutes. So reducing the amount of decisions that we have to make, and certainly the amount of important decisions we have to make, and probably even more importantly, the non-important decisions that we have to make uh, is really, really powerful and helps people have that sense of control. And believe it or not, and this is anecdotal, I don't have the research necessarily, but if you give somebody control over their inbox, it has a measurable effect, I think, on the their like satisfaction in life and their sense of control in general, mm -hmm. uh, which is weird, but it's true. Uh, same thing with, and, and then you, you can mirror that over to data. You know, I had all this data coming in about my health, about blood tests and the aura ring eventually, and like every kind of tracking you could imagine. And it's a lot of information, but if you start to do something with it, you start to take some sense of control over it. It becomes, it, it's a very, very powerful experience for most people. Mm -hmm. So, so that sense of control, I always believe that control was the antidote to stress. Mm. And just as a way of thinking about the, the email, um problem because i feel like it's so relatable for everyone how would you go about kind of simplifying email if you if you had to you know break it down in simple terms without giving away your secret sauce no it's fine i mean i i, I can i can tell you the whole thing right now um so <laughs> keep it keep in mind that this is a this is a way of making more effective decisions period okay so it, email is a great example and it, I mean, it, it's, there's a big benefit here to people in terms of their email, but this is about how we make decisions in general. So it's, it's the three D's is, is the, the system. As for email specifically, if you have a ton and ton of tons of email, the first thing you want to do is archive everything that's over two weeks old because, and I would say maybe even a week because an email, 
with the pace of email, if you haven't dealt with something that's in the last like week or two, it's probably not relevant anymore. But mm -hmm. archive it all. And we're not deleting it. We're just archiving it. So it's not in the inbox. And then we need to have one folder that has that is called optional. And that's important. You don't need hundreds of folders. You don't need dozens of folders. We, there's actually research on that. But we just need one. We have the inbox, and then we have an optional folder. And mm -hmm. then we start by creating a filter or in Outlook, it's called a rule. And that says that any email that has the word unsubscribe in it skips the inbox and goes right into the optional folder. Takes care of about 60% of the emails that most people get. And it's important that it is optional because yeah, you might say like, I would really love to read that. I love reading this, this newsletter. I read it every single day. I never wanna miss it. It's fine. It's a newsletter, it's still optional. And when you click on the optional folder, and by the way, I look at my optional folder maybe once a month. Um, you look at the optional folder, and your brain clicks into optional mode. The inbox now becomes a place of actual activity, work, and maybe hopefully things that are important. So now the email's in the inbox. We have the three Ds. We have deal with it, delete, or sorry, um, delete it, deal with it, or defer it. Delete it is simple, say no, right? And again, keep thinking about how this applies to regular decisions in our life. So we say no, decline, deny, whatever it is. About 40% of the emails that we find that people respond to don't require a response at all. So when people send an email that says K or THX, right? Like, got it. Don't do that, right? It's just, it creates a boomerang effect that more email you get, the more email you send, the more email you get. I have I have another interview after this, and the person sent me three emails with information confirmation email, and I have not responded to any of them, nor will I, because there's there's I don't need to. I've got it. She'll show up at eleven, and I'll be there at eleven. You know, we'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I don't need to create additional email for her or for me. Yeah. Uh, so that's delete it. Say no. The second one is to deal with it. So if you can deal with something right now without a big mental shift. Like, and right now, meaning like in the next two to three minutes, deal with it right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And dealing with it could include deferring it, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, delegating it, right? So dealing with it could include passing it off to an assistant, a partner, a spouse, whatever the situation might call for. Because if you do that effectively and you delegate effectively, you're done in that moment. There's really nothing else that you can do. Mm -hmm. So you're done. Send it off. Uh, so that's deal with it right now. And the other thing about that is we get that little dopamine hit because we accomplished something. More importantly, it starts to expel or to dispel the idea that like this land of later exists and we can deal with it then because yeah, it doesn't. Right. There's always like there's always going to be something happening later. Like we, we I, I'll just take a minute. I'll deal with it later. Yeah, that, that doesn't work ever. You're just sort of shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. The third one is to defer it. So if you can't say no, you can't deal with it right now, then you have to defer it. And this is this gets a little more complex but I can still make it a quick explanation. We need to defer, not procrastinate. We need to defer, meaning we're going to put this off to a time where we have determined we can more effectively deal with that particular kind of a thing. And this gets into a whole thing about like your peak time and the best time of day to do different things and worse things, which I have a whole other conversation on that, which if you want, we can get into. But if I decide that I'm only doing podcast interviews on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and somebody sends me a request or we need to talk about something, whatever, I can defer that to Tuesday or Thursday. And in Gmail, you can do that with the snooze functionality, and you can also do that in Outlook built in, no problem. So the email goes away and it comes back at that time. You want to do Finance Fridays, anything having to do with finances, a bill, uh, an, in an invoice, whatever it is, defer it to Friday. And then Friday morning, you can batch that activity and deal with it then. And you know what you're getting into and you can start to control, not necessarily the amount of time you spend on things, but mm. where your attention goes, which is more important. Yeah. It, sorry to cut you off. Do you, you want to finish the thought? No, I was going to say it's such a helpful framework. And I particularly resonate with what you were saying um, in terms of deal with it, because I've been noticing, you know, everything with the podcast has been growing very quickly, which is amazing, really high velocity. But as a result of that, there's just a lot of things that are coming and going every single day. And what I was noticing is that tasks that could take me less than two to three minutes hey, can you send me a Zoom link for this podcast? Hey, I should book this guest on the show. Hey, I could do this really quickly. I'd be like, oh, I'll just do it later. But then I wouldn't actually, I wouldn't have a framework to get it done. So these balls would just keep dropping. And then I started reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. So similar similar thing of like, hey, if it takes you two minutes, just do it right then and there. And I've been incorporating that the last month or so 
And it's been just so much more helpful just doing a simple thing like that. I mean, it, it, it's not that, I mean, it's simple. Yes, but it's, it's extremely powerful. There's a, I like the expression that small hinges swing, big doors, swing, big doors. Yeah. Right. Um, and the other thing that's I think important about that too, especially if you're dealing with communication, right. Is that we have a limited amount of attention from certain people. And so, and, and this sounds, by the way, I, I know that this sounds counterproductive or counterintuitive to a lot of other productivity advice that people purport to give, but I believe that they are wrong. Mm. Um, so if somebody emails you, like I, I was walking my dog this morning, somebody emailed me about setting up a time to meet and I want to meet with this person. And uh, they, they emailed me, I saw it. And then I immediately took out, I, I, I saw it like on my Apple watch, I took out my phone and I responded right away. And then she got back to me a minute later and I responded right away and we picked the time. I know from previous contact with this person and similar people, and when I mean similar people, I mean like maybe slightly older, slightly less tech. If I don't respond to her while she is clearly sitting at her computer sending me the email, I probably wouldn't hear from her for a week, mm. right? So the productivity experts out there will tell you that like that's pulling your attention and that's you know ruining your focus and like you shouldn't be reactive to email. But at the same time, with what you're not then taking into account is that if I don't answer that person right now and I wait, you know, 10 minutes or an hour or whatever, and then I don't hear back from her for three days, my attention is taken. Mm, yes. Because I'll be, th should I follow up with her? Did she kill me? email? like, I really, uh, the time that I proposed to meet is in two days and she's not getting back to me. Like what? it doesn't work. Yeah. So like, you know, strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> Before we get into the episode, let's talk about Fawn Bone Brass Carnivore Blend. 100%. Yeah, we've been huge fans of bone broth the last few months. It's really fueled our carnivore journey. Um, bone broth is incredibly nourishing, especially on a carnivore, or animal based or just any type of diet, to be honest with you. And what's great about Fawn is that they're a very simple, pure product. So their product is just boiled bones, water, salt. And most of their products have spices like turmeric, cayenne, cracked pepper. But they actually just came out with their carnivore broth, which is very simple chicken bone broth, water, and salt too. So they're eliminating all their spices and just giving you something very pure that won't disrupt the gut. Yeah, I think one of the things we talk about with the elimination diet is the fact that there's so many things that do actually affect how your body reacts to the food you put in your body. And the fact that they're just doing a pure bone broth with bones and just the minimal ingredients, I think is huge. And the carnivore audience will love this one. Uh, Fawn does regenerative bone, so it's really high quality stuff. Go check it out. Use our promo code in the link below. Yep, code Mafia will get you 15% off your first order. Right. I, I feel like these productivity hacks, if you want to call them that, uh, they're like, it, when you describe that to me, I'm like, this sounds like it's very simple, but then like the how to actually implement it, I feel like is where everyone really struggles, right? Like actually being able to keep themselves accountable. So do you have any tips for people just in terms of accountability or really just like, you know, ha having this system work for them so that they can just really like implement it into their lives. Well, I do have to say with the inbox zero stuff, when you, when people sort of get it and sometimes it happens very quickly, like it cements really quickly because they, they see it, they see the results. Um, I have tons, I mean, I countless people at this point who have said like, Oh, I, I had like, you know, 5,000 emails in my inbox and I've been in inbox zero for a week and it's like the greatest feeling ever. <laughs> um, it's when they start to implement that in other parts of their life um, and they start to see that that as a decision making matrix in general. So the email part, honestly, I don't find that to be, uh, at least from what I see from clients, people I work with, I don't see that one to be so hard to implement. It's when you start to, again, uh, transfer that over to like real life decisions, you know, like a request to be on someone's podcast, for example, or a, uh, uh, a request to have a meeting, a request to do a deal, whatever it might be. And you start to think like, Three decisions, that's it. I don't have 30 decisions. I don't have 40 options. I don't have five. I have three possible choices. This person wants something from me. They're asking me something. I can say no. I can say, yeah, let's do it right now. Let's set up that meeting right now. Let's figure it out. Or I can say, yeah, you know, um, this cocktail party, like I'm, I'm at right now, I'm not really in the mindset to do this, but I would love to do this. So why don't we talk at this time? Because that's when I normally handle these kinds of things. Mm. 
And now you're, you're not procrastinating. You are taking active control of the situation. You're making a determination that you're going to do something at a more effective time and maybe a more effective venue. And you're right. in control. All right. Do you find that with clients, when you get them to do something as simple as going to inbox zero, that it leads to almost like a chain reaction where they start trying to take control and optimize for all these other aspects of their life, like their finances, their kids, their general scheduling, because they're like, oh my God, it felt so good to just clear this thing out. That's so essential. And then they just start branching out into other aspects of their life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a big one. A really big one. The, the next really big one that then sort of comes out of that is now that we think about deferring, right? The next conversation that comes up. And to me, it's the number one silver bullet in the productivity arsenal is asynchronous communication. Mm -hmm. right? so, so the opposite of what we're doing right now. Uh, so I would say that 99% of my communications at this point is done asynchronously. And I cannot stress enough, like that is the silver bullet. Like if you can switch, the more communication you can switch to asynchronous, their magnitudes of productivity will, will just shower you with their glory. Uh, this podcast interview that you and I are doing, that we're, mm -hmm. the, the three of us are doing, and then the one, the interview I have right after this, which is not a mis it's not an accident that they're back to back. These are the only two meetings that I have on my calendar this entire week. There's nothing else that is scheduled on my calendar. And to put that in context, I currently offer unlimited one-on-one -on -one private coaching to 25 entrepreneurs in seven time zones. Okay. All of it is done over Voxer. So I know Brad, I've introduced, you got introduced to yes. Voxer. And Harry's right, on so, it too. Okay. So when people sign up to do coaching with me, first of all, the sales call is actually done over Voxer as well. So anybody in the world could go to voxwithari.com. It's a one and a half minute YouTube video that explains what Voxer is and how I like to be contacted. They get on there. We have a conversation asynchronously, meaning they talk when they want. I listen when I want and I respond when I want. Now, the fascinating thing about this from a sales point of view is that what used to be a 30 to 45 minute sales conversation, you know, booked back to back six times in a row on a Tuesday and Wednesday to Thursday, whatever. Now it's seven minutes of exchange audio over the course of 16 hours with the exact same result and a better close rate. Once they do that, they're immediately already on Vox or they understand what the platform can do. And now we do our coaching. And again, my coaching is unlimited, private, one on one coaching. They can access to me whenever they want. They, I have several clients I speak to every single day, but might be for a minute or two. I can listen to it at two, three, four times speed. I can think about my answer four or five times, and then I can record it when I'm walking the dog or between dropping one of my kids off at soccer practice and going home to pick up the other one. Uh, and it is not only more convenient, but it is actually a more effective form of coaching than I have ever experienced. And my clients would say the same. It also means time zones never matter. They don't have to hold anything in and wait five days till our one hour appointment on Wednesday to you know get it off their chest, something that happened on a Friday, mm -hmm. which, which then pulls their attention. It's how I communicate with contractors that I work with. It's actually now how I often communicate with my mother. Mm. Um, and, it's, uh, and I'm able to stay in more touch with people in my life that way and more connected than I ever was before. And I... I believe that I could take on probably 20 more clients and not have an issue. So I've effectively figured out a way to scale one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm, that's unbelievable. Ari, is there anything specific about Voxer that you like that yes. the note message of iMessage can't do? Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, so uh, iMessage is a pain. Uh, first of all, like everybody has the same complaint where like if you are holding the button to record and then your finger slides off, like you lose right. the message. If, right. So there's a lot of tools that do voice communication. WhatsApp does it, Telegram, they all do it. Voxer has one extremely unique feature. Excuse me. Um, it is the only one that allows you to do synchronous as well as asynchronous. Meaning if you do a WhatsApp message, let's say you record a 10 minute message. So I'm talking for 10 minutes. It has to upload, which, you know, maybe that takes 30 seconds. The person on the other end has to download it. They listen for 10 minutes and then back and forth. With Voxer, if I start talking within 0.2 seconds of me beginning to speak, you can start to listen on the other end. Hmm. If you're not there, no problem. You listen to it later. 
but you can listen to it that way. So I have had lots of conversations that feel like phone calls with clients uh, all over the world through Voxer. And then one of us gets busy or distracted or whatever, and we move on and then we come back and it's a, it feels like a very seamless conversation. Uh, it really, really changes the flow of how it works. And you never have somebody sort of like sitting there waiting for their attention. Yeah, I like that. How do you go about getting other people to download Voxer in your life? Because I, I mean, it's probably easier with coaching, but like in your life, you're like, hey, this is just how I communicate with people. Can you please download this and like start using it for me? Like, <laughs> it's a big ask, I feel like. Yeah, no, it is. Um, and and uh, fortunately, I've been successful with that because uh, it, I find that it is actually quite easy to train people to human. And I, I say that, I know it doesn't sound great, but to train people to communicate with you the way that you want. Yeah. The problem for most people is that, first of all, they don't have a really clear sense of how they want to communicate or where they should. And that's why in like a lot of companies you have, you know, the boss will send a Slack message. If you don't get back to them right away, then they'll email you and text you and then they'll come knock on your door, you know, if it wasn't COVID times, because there's just no sense or plan to it. So I'm pretty clear about things with, it's not just like, hey, if you want to talk to me, this is the way to do it. It's more like, if you vox me, and I'm and you're in the, the learning phase, I will make sure that I get back to you like immediately and sort of cement that pathway. If you email me or call me or text, I will purposely take longer to get back to you. Um, and that that takes like one interaction usually to, to fix that. I if you call my phone, my cell phone, the voicemail says, do not leave a voicemail. It will not be listened to and it will be deleted. Send me an email. And here's the email address. And I have had like, I, I remember this one time, the power company. Is calling me for that. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a not bill paid or whatever. But the this pow, the power company called me like twelve times uh, every day. Uh, they called every day for like twelve days, and they were they started leaving messages being like, "We don't have email access. We cannot email you. Please call back this number." And I just kept ignoring it. Sure enough, like the fourteenth day, they emailed me, um, and I I remember very clearly. I was like in a meeting, and I was like, "I need to respond to this really quickly." Excuse me, and I responded to them in like seven seconds after they got back to me. Never got a call again. <laughs> there you go. Ari, what percentage of meetings would you say are generally unnecessary? 99. Yeah. I mean, really like 99%. I mean, this is a necessary meeting because you guys and I can interact in a way that might be a little bit more challenging over as asynchronous and might be a little less natural and maybe whatever. Um, so I would consider this a, you know, a, a reasonable use of synchronous time. And then uh, some brainstorming meetings, uh, oftentimes, if they're done correctly, really should be done synchronously. So you can really sort of feed off the energy in a way. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but yeah, I'd say about 99%. Did something change, uh, you know, as you were kind of learning these uh, you know, time management systems for your interpretation of time and like maximizing your time? Like, was there a moment that you just realized, hey, this is just a much more efficient way of communicating? Uh, yeah. So I, I had, uh, for a couple of years, I had a virtual assistant company, uh, that I'd started with a friend and then I ended up uh, moving on after a couple of years back to what I, to, to less doing. And we were, it was the first time I'd used Slack in a, in my own company setting. Mm -hmm. And we had at one point, I think 190 people in 17 time zones. Mm -hmm. And that was my first real sort of foray into true asynchronous communication. E email is an asynchronous communication method, right? So is text messaging, so is a lot of things, but most people don't use them that way. You know, the typical way that you'll see somebody uh, text, and I'm sure I, I know that you've all seen this, is they'll send the text and then they'll just stand there like waiting for the, the triple bubble thing, you know, like, and they'll just wait. And that's really not the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to send your message and sort of move on. So Slack, in that setting with that many people was the first time that I really had to experience of like, there are gonna be like, hey, there are gonna be certain times a day when I'm gonna deal with this and other times when I just can't. And at the time also like, we had just had our fourth child, like I was busy. Uh, and then there was a tool, Voxer existed, but I didn't know about it at that point. There was a tool that got introduced called Roger, which was a very similar idea. And it was like sort of the, the old like Nextel, like chirp, chirp, walkie talkie idea, which is what I kind of see Voxer as. It was called Roger and uh, it was a startup and it was great. And it, it did 
for the most part, did this thing. And we started using that. And what I started to find really quickly was that using voice gave me, at least as a coach, like voice gives me so much more information, the intonation, the emotional uh, tonality, whatever, the, the cadence oftentimes will tell me more than the words that the people are using, right? And so we started using that for stand-ups. Um, so I started doing these asynchronous stand-ups. And, you know, the person that would write like, you know, no report, like all good. If they said that, You'd be like, no, 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 there's something off here. And I would reach out and be like, hey, you didn't sound great. Like, what's going on? And it would open up all these conversations they hadn't had before. Um, so it very, very quickly, I started to see the power of being able to use asynchronous voice uh, almost exclusively. That's amazing. Um, it, yeah, you. I feel like you would think at first glance that maybe asynchronous communication would not lead to the most genuine interaction, maybe for whatever reason, because we're just programmed maybe like to just have this dependency and instant communication over Slack or like, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, but it seems like your interactions with asynchronous has been the complete opposite. It's one of the most effective tools of communication that people could be incorporating. Um, Ari, I'm just curious for someone that's listening to this conversation that is really resonating with your mindset, a lot of the tools that you've been talking about, if they want more access to what you're speaking about, do you have any books that you've written that you would recommend or any programs or, you know, coaching opportunities that we could maybe plug here? Sure. Well, I've, I've, I've written 12 books. So the, uh, the last one, the most recent one is called on productivity, which was sort of my, like my epitome of productivity. I don't, I don't, I, th I think that's going to be the last one on productivity, uh, but they can go to lessdoing.com. Everything's there. They can, anybody who's listening is welcome to go to voxwithari.com and you can reach out to me on Voxer and it will be, you, you'll know it's me answering. It's not going to be an automation. It's not going to be a VA. Um, and I, I really do welcome that. People can, can reach out that way. I, I would add also just to sort of keep this in mind uh, with the asynchronous communication is that it truly becomes, there is that concern. People always bring that up about like a oh, lack of connection if we're not like live. I have actually found it to be quite the opposite. There's something fascinating about speaking into the sort of vacuum of uh, like just talking into a vacuum basically, because I don't know if you guys have, have ever done podcasting where you're not interviewing, where you're just recording something and then sharing it later. I've, I've done, yeah. Okay. So you have, and but good example, by the way, you're both nodding and like making, mo you know, so I'm going to react to that mm -hmm. in the, in the vacuum of Voxer, people just sort of talk into the ether <laughs> and they, uh, they end up talking them into sell things that are like a lot deeper than they might get into otherwise. So I get it. I do productivity coaching, but it's a lot of psychology and a lot of really deep stuff. And I've, the things that used to take me six months to get to to a place with somebody in person now it could be six days in Voxer because they'll send me a 12 minute message and the first five minutes are about email and about task management. And then it's like, but I had this argument with so-and-so today and I don't know what you mean. They just go on. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. Yeah. Well, all right. It's been a great conversation. I think the second half of this conversation has obviously been really focused on productivity and just in improving communication. And I think that both of those things are great ways to reduce stress, which obviously I think a lot of people that in itself will just improve their health. So I hope our audience gets a lot of value just out of that, like some practical things that they can do to reduce stress. And I know that you've used these for yourself to do that. So just appreciate you sharing your story and then giving our audience some great tools just to, you know, reduce stress and improve their life. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks guys for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Ari. Thank you.